Okay, in this video, we're going to talk about um, some other lessons that we've learned from aversive stimuli. So aversive stimuli, but in particular shock, have been used to study the effects of bad things because it can simulate sort of bad things in life and stressors. And so it's been used quite a bit. And so I'm going to talk about three particular series of examples where we learn something from this. First, we'll talk about signaled versus unsignaled shock. Then we'll talk about the Seligman and Meyer paper that you read. And then just briefly mention uh, some follow-up similar studies with the uh, Brady's monkeys. So we can study the effects of signaled versus unsignaled shock. So the way it might work is you have, um, say, like you have a shuttle box, and one half of it is gray, and there's a signal, a light, that uh, serves as a CS. And there's a doorway, and initially, uh, and the uh, sorry, the other side of the shuttle box here is black and white striped, and you want it to be visually distinct from uh, from another uh, from the other side. So during training, you close the door and you give inescapable shock in both sides of the shuttle box. So they get about three shocks per hour, uh, but in this side, the light comes on just before the shock is delivered. It's signaled shock. And so then during the testing, you open the doorway and just measure which side of the box will the animal spend most of its time in, either the signaled or the unsignaled side. Now remember, they get the shocks at the same rate, no matter which side they are. And if you were wondering, or maybe I could ask you the question, which side of the box would you be in? And you'd probably pick the signal side. And the reason you would pick the signal side is because um, you not only do you know when the shock is coming, you know more importantly when it's not coming, right? So you can relax when you know it's not coming. You can, it's not, uh, you're not always anxious. If you're over here, you have no idea when the shock is coming and you're probably always anxious. So the bottom line here is, is that when bad things happen to us, we'd rather know when they're coming rather than when they're not coming, right? Um, that just seems to make common sense from our own experiences. So let's also talk about um, learned helplessness in the Seligman and Meyer study that you read. And I'm going to sort of break this down for you. It's a little complicated with all of the groups, but here's the deal. They started with some harness training. So they put dogs in a harness training, and they had an escape group, and this escape group could they were delivered a shock and they could stop the shock by moving their head and pressing a panel so this is an escape group because they're escaping the shock they had a, what they called a normal control group uh, they had no harness training and they went straight to the shuttle box test of the experiment then they had what they called a yoked group now it's called a yoke group i have a picture over here because you um, link it to another group in this case you're linking it to the escape group and so they received the same shocks as the escape group, same temporal pattern, same duration, et cetera. But they could not control them, right? They were controlled by the escape group. So this is the yoked groups. They had no control of the shocks and received them in the harness. So uh, inescapable shock. So at test, the animals were put into a shuttle box for, for 10 um, trials where they could either escape or avoid uh, the shock altogether. So they had a light that signaled the shock and they could jump over a barrier uh, to escape the shock. Um, and so here's the table one. So you can see the mean latency for escaping, percent of subjects failing to escape the shock. So zero here, mean number of failures to escape the shock. And what you see here is the escape group learned this task pretty quickly. Makes sense, they were already in an escape situation with the harness. The normal group also learned to escape for the most part, but you see the yoked control that um, was previously exposed to inescapable shock did not really learn, or 75% of them didn't learn to escape at all. Right, so they just kind of took the shock even when they were put in the shuttle box and able to escape the shock. Now in their second study, what they did is they had uh, more intensive. So there's actually three phases here. So they had the shuttle box for escape training. This is what you would call a pre-phase. They then had the harness for in-escape experience, just like experiment one. And then, of course, they put them in the shuttle box to see if they would escape or if they wouldn't escape. They had several groups here. They had the pre-escape group. So 
they were put in the shuttle box and they were allowed to escape in the shuttle box and the harness they received inescapable shock and then they were given the shuttle box test and the no pre group there was no pre exposure to the shuttle box they had inescapable shock and then they were put in the shuttle box for testing the no inescape group never had inescapable shock so they escaped in the shuttle box the they were put in the harness, but there was no shock, and then they were given the shuttle box test. And the pre-inescapable group, shuttle box, inescapable shock in the shuttle box, no phase, and then the shuttle box test. Right? So that's really complicated. You can pause this and go back and forth uh, as you need to, but let's look at and see what happens. So uh, when you look at the experimental results, the key figure is figure three here. So this is showing you the mean number of avoidances. So if it's really high, that means that they're learning to escape the shock. If it's lower, they're not learning to escape the shock. And they're, you know, for, for all intents and purposes, receiving more shocks that they could escape. So if you look at the groups that escaped, the no inescape group, so the one that never received inescapable shock, and the one that learned to escape initially, well, they're learning to escape. So it sort of inoculates them when they learn to escape initially. Even if they're exposed to inescapable shock, they later learn to escape. But these other groups had what they called learned helplessness, where they're not learning to escape the shock, even though now they can. And so the no pre and the pre-escape, inescape, groups uh, are not learning to escape, right? So there's been lots of applications to human behavior, in particular depression. So people who suffer depression show some of these very same uh, symptoms in that uh, a bit of hopelessness or inability to control their environment, even when they might have control over it. Uh, it's also been applied to like learning in the classroom. So if you've ever felt frustrated by material or something and just given up and saying, well, I can't do this uh, material because you had some early um, early feedback that suggested that you were not on the right path. It also could be applied to voter apathy, right? Uh, this is a real big problem, of course, but in the 2016 election, right, 58.1% of eligible voters voted, right? So and in particular in the swing states. So uh, in the 2016 election was decided by, you know, in some cases, one, two, three percent in some of these swing states. And it turns out that in the swing states, 35 to 40 percent of people did not vote. So that could have changed, easily changed the outcome uh, if people just voted. But why do you feel like your vote doesn't count? Because things seem to stay the same and you have the same problems year after year and it seems like it doesn't matter even though some cases it may matter like it did in the uh, 2016 election. So lesson there is go vote. So the last little bit of Brady's monkey, so Brady was a researcher and he did some inescapable shock with monkeys. One monkey could control the shock, the other monkey had inescapable shock and they were yoked together and they observed some of the same kinds of things, but also observed high stress response in the, un, the, the group that received uncontrollable shock, right? So this shows us that, and, and subsequent studies also showed us, control and prediction uh, is, of the shock is, uh, decreases the amount of stress that the animal or the person has. But uncontrollable shock, highly stressful, can even lead to uh, severe health effects like suppressing the immune system and things of that nature. So some lessons learned from exposure to aversive stimuli. Now in this last little bit, I want to just talk about the relationship between classical and operant conditioning. And we'll continue this discussion more with some more examples in our class. But remember, uh, just to review some of the differences, right? So classical conditioning involves us that, that reflexive behavior, operant conditioning, uh, more behavior under the animal's control, the person's control that determines the consequences. 
Classical conditioning involves an association between two stimuli. Operant conditioning involves an association between a response and some kind of stimuli or consequence. The reality is, and we, we learn these as separate things. So in lecture two, we learned about classical conditioning. In this lecture, and these many parts, we've learned about operant conditioning. But the reality is, it, for many real-world behaviors, many times both of them can, can co-occur. And I have a couple of examples that illustrate this. So the first is avoidance, right? So avoidance is a form of negative reinforcement, right? Behavior prevents the occurrence of a reverse of stimulus, right? Well, in order to prevent the occurrence of the reverse of stimulus, there has to be a signal. There has to be a conditioned stimulus. So it's like half classical conditioning, half operant conditioning. And so avoidance is one of those clear situations where it's a little bit of both mixed in there, and you can't really separate them. The other thing is, um, the example I like to give here is magazine training. So remember that one of the prototypical examples of operant conditioning is a rat in an operant box pressing a lever to receive food reinforcement, right? That's a classical kind of an example. Well, the magazines, uh, the uh, feeders, make a lot of noise. So they click when they deliver a food pellet. And this is helpful for conditioning, but they don't have to. And as a matter of fact, there was um a time when the, the companies that made the feeders made a noiseless feeder. But the noiseless feeder was a disaster. And the reason the noiseless feeder was a disaster is it became really, really difficult to train the rats to press the bar for food reinforcement when the feeder didn't make a noise. It's as if you needed that click to have them associate or learn to an associate um, a behavior like pressing the bar with the delivery of the food pellet. So um, we talk about you know, rats pressing a bar um, to get a food reinforcer, but oftentimes that classical conditioning is sort of needed to get them to that point to begin with. So the reality or my point here is again, that really when you get down into it, yeah, there are some specific examples in the laboratory of pure classical conditioning and pure operant conditioning, and we can probably even find them in the real world. But the reality is a lot of our behavior is this mixture of the two, and both of them are really important, and both of them are really influencing our behavior. So we'll pick this up when we talk about, uh, in the classroom, we'll talk about um, the practical implications uh, of these uh, different forces that affect our behavior.